Uh, I am, this is Christine Deschler, Chair of the Finance Committee. I permit me to confirm that all members and persons anticipated on the agenda are present and can hear me. Uh, members and staff, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Um, Jordan Rummy, I think, is not here tonight, correct? Shane Lundell? Here. Um, is Jennifer Seuss here? She may be late. Uh, Sophie Miglia Magliazzo? Is Sophie here? She's listed as here. She's on mute. Yes, sorry. I'm All right. here. All right. Brian, you're here. I'm here. Carolyn White? Carolyn? Uh, Rebecca? Yes. Josh? Yeah. Hello. Grant Gibbion? Here. Yes. Charlie, Charlie Foskett? Here. John Griffin? Yes. Daryl Harmer? Here. Annie LaCourt? Here. Alan Jones? Here. Topher Hyam? Here. Peggy Bliss? Here. Alan Tosti? Here. Uh, Dean Carmen? Here. And Dave McKenna? Here. And Tara Bradley? Here. Tara's here. Right, Tara's here. Yep. Here, yes. Um, all right. Um, do we have any of the public present? If we do, could you Sean from ACMI. That's it. All right. We have ACMI. All right. So um, this is an open meeting of the Arlington Finance Committee. It's being conducted remotely consistent with Governor Baker's executive order of March 12, 2020, as extended on July 16, 2022, due to the current state of emergency in the Commonwealth due to the outbreak of the COVID-19 virus. In order to mitigate the transmission of the COVID-19 virus, we have been advised and directed by the Commonwealth to suspend public gatherings, and as such, the governor's order suspends the requirement of the open meeting law to have all meetings in a publicly accessible physical location. Further, all members of the public bodies are allowed and encouraged to participate remotely. The order, which you can find posted with agenda materials for this meeting, allows public bodies to meet entirely remotely so long as reasonable public access is afforded so that the public can follow along with the deliberations of the meeting. Ensuring public access does not ensure public participation unless such participation is required by law. This meeting will feature public comment only in writing by email to tbradley at town.arlington.ma.us.com. For this meeting, the Arlington Finance Committee is convening by video conference via Zoom app as posted on the town's website, identifying how the public may join and comment. Please note that this meeting is being recorded and that attendees are participating by video conference. Accordingly, please be aware that other folks may be able to see you and take care not to screen share your computer. Anything that you broadcast may be captured by the recording. All supporting materials that have been provided to members of this body are available on the town's website, unless otherwise noted. The public is encouraged to follow along using the posted agenda unless the chair knows otherwise. Before turning to the first item on the agenda, permit me to cover some ground rules for effective and clear conduct of our business and to ensure accurate meeting minutes. The chair will introduce each speaker after they conclude their remarks. The chair will go down the line. Members inviting each by name to provide any comment, questions, or motions. Please hold until your name is called. <clears throat> Further remember to mute your phone or computer when you're not speaking. Please remember to speak clearly and in a way that helps generate accurate minutes. For any response, please wait until the chair yields the floor to you and state your name before speaking. If members wish to engage in colloquy with other members, please do so through the chair, taking care to identify yourself. Finally, each vote taken in this meeting will be conducted by roll call vote, and the chair will vote only in instances where there is a tie. So before I <clears throat> describe what we're going to do tonight, I want to give a hello to Peggy Bliss. She was she missed our first meeting. Um, I should have uh, I introduced her at our last meeting. Um, so I want to give a, a welcome to Peggy, who is new to um, the finance committee, sort of. Uh, she has been married to a finance committee member, Bill Keller, for uh, who is on the committee for several years. So she's new, but she knows what we're doing. Um, and she's joined us anyway. <laughs> sort of. 
Any, <laughs> anyway, <laughs> so welcome, Peggy. Oh, thank you. It's good to be here. It's good to have you. All right, so tonight's lineup will um, we'll approve minutes and then we'll get into the uh, public safety budgets. And then Annie has several budgets. Um, and then when they have concluded, then I think there are, we have a few other budgets that uh, are ready. Um, and we'll also, if we have time, uh, we'll also go back to the finance committee um, budget. So with that, uh, minutes. Does anyone have any revisions to the minutes of February 1st, 2023? I am not seeing any hands. So I th think we are. Madam Chairman, I move that we accept the minutes as presented. Do I have a second? Second. Aye. All right. Um, we will take a roll call vote on the minutes. Um, Jordan, is he still? Jordan's still absent. Um, Shane? Yes. Jennifer? Sophie? Sophie? Yes. Brian? Abstain, I wasn't here. Carolyn. Carolyn's still absent. Rebecca? Yes. Josh? Yes. Grant? Yes. Charlie? Yes. John? Yes. Daryl? Yes. Annie? Yes. Alan Jones? Yes. Topher? Yes. Peggy? Yes. Al Tosti? Al Tosti? Uh, yes, but down the bottom, it says the meeting adjourned at X colon XX. Shouldn't we have a... Oh, I'm on that. Sorry, I'm, I'm, I have my uh, mouse on the um, meeting minutes for today as I'm recording the um, results of voting on the minutes, but these... These are the minutes. Sorry, back to the minutes. Okay. Yes. All right. Um, Dean. Yes. And Dave. Yes. All right. All right. The minutes of February sixth, twenty twenty three, have been approved. So let's go into uh, budgets. Um, Daryl and John, I'll defer to you at this point. Okay, so for tonight, we have the police budget that I'm going to do and the fire budget uh, that John is going to do. Um, we still have inspections to schedule, um, but these are the two, two big ones. So I have a short deck. Um, um, Can everybody see? Yes. Um, okay, so first up, um, there was a, um, is this big enough, by the way? Can, people... <clears throat> Can everybody see it? Yes. Um, so there was a, uh, apparently there was a production glitch um, in the manager's budget. Uh, that affected some of the line items for fiscal 22. It didn't affect any of the bottom line totals. Uh, but if you can see here where this blue box is, um, when I first looked at it, the, the numbers obviously look really strange. Um, the spending, the actuals in, in 22 look wildly different from all the other years. So um, as we reviewed it um, with, the, uh, with Chief Flaherty and her uh, budget analyst, um, it became apparent that um, the problem was that these line, item, line items were actually printed a row too high. Uh, so I don't know what happened. There was an Excel issue, obviously. Um, so this is actually the correct 
uh, page, you see the, the line items line up better. So again, as I said, it only affected 22, and it didn't affect the bottom line total. So um, using this until uh, until we get an official uh, correction from the town. Uh, so from a budget perspective, uh, the salaries lines are um, pretty basic. The only big number is 5,100 for salaries. And most of that increase is uh, differentials and um, education credits. Um, one question I have that got answered for me today is you'll see uh, there's a line 5112 that says school credit and 5115 that says differential. Uh, these are actually fairly small numbers. If you were to look at the salary details, um, that actually has very large numbers. So it turns out that for uh, police officers and ranking officers, uh, their school, and Dave, you probably know this, their school credit and differentials show up in the, in the salary details pages and then get rolled into this line 5100. Uh, these two lines, 5112 and 5115, are actually for civilians. Um, who get school credits or differentials. Um, then on the expenses uh, area, um, the only two issues are um, 5218 training and 5236 um, uniforms, budgets, and gloves. And I'm going to explain those now. Um, uh, just to run through some of the budget increases uh, and other issues, from fiscal 23 to 24, um, the parole officers um, is going to arbitration in May. Uh, remember that Sandy mentioned that um, when he briefed us uh, last week. Uh, the ranking officers apparently haven't given their uh, approval to go ahead into, into negotiations. So those haven't even started yet. So um, this is obviously an unknown with the impact of collective bargaining is going to be, although based on what Sandy said last week, um, this increase, I guess, could be significant. Um, I just talked about the credits and differentials. On the expenses side, the two line items are training, uh, which increased $10,000, and that is going to cover a succession training for um, Chief Flaherty's position. Uh, she's uh, planning on retiring in the next year or so. Um, so she... Um, very smartly is doing some succession planning and they have money to send uh, one person to training. And I think they're trying to get a grant to, um, to send a second person. And then under uniforms, badges and gloves, there's an increase of $25,000. And that covers the cost of bulletproof vests, bulletproof vests that should be, um, where uh, the costs were shifted from the capital budget to the operating budget. Um, on the vacancy side, uh, they have, um, in the budget book, uh, they have three parole officers, uh, one sergeant, one animal control officer, a social worker, and a dispatcher. And then you'll see the third line down, uh, after the book was printed, uh, one of the patrol officers resigned to uh, become a firefighter in Cambridge. Um, so that seemed to be an interesting career move. Um, and they have filled the social worker position that got filled in December. And uh, people might remember that's the position that's split between uh, the police department and health and human services. Police has 75% of that budget uh, and uh, HHS has 25%. Um, and then the uh, dispatcher, um, they went through a whole interview process, which actually I'm gonna talk about in just a second. Uh, and uh, they're having to repost the position. So of the eight vacancies, uh, seven that were in the budget book and then one that showed up after, um, they've still got seven. Uh, they were able to fill one. So on this dispatcher um, position, um, it, it's actually kind of interesting and kind of a little bit very illustrative of what they're up against in terms of hiring. Um, this dispatcher position is not even in civil service. Uh, they described it as a revolving door, so they um, obviously have trouble filling it to begin with. Uh, so they posted the position, they got 40 
uh, applications for it. Um, they selected 20 for an interview, so they're already down to just 50% of the applicants. And of those 20, uh, seven accepted the interview. And then of the seven, only three showed up for the interview. Wow. And then they made an offer. And then it turned out they, uh, the person had religious objections to um, uh, COVID vaccination. So they are all the way back to reposting the position. Um, so that just kind of shows the, some of the challenges they have. And as I said, this is not even a civil service position. Uh, when you get to civil service, um, they, they're even more constrained. Um, I think people know civil service is now close to 140 years old. Uh, it was originally designed to uh, protect uh, employees um, from patronage and political, inter political, inter man, political interference. Um, but now policies and collective bargaining uh, have provided a lot of those protections and in many cases more effectively than civil service. Um, so under civil service, hiring and retention um, has gotten increasingly difficult and increasingly competitive. Uh, towns have to hire from lists based on scores from state administered tests. And uh, there's also absolute preference as veterans, disabled and so on. Um, so now towns are actually offering signing bonuses and education benefits uh, to try to be more competitive. Uh, the other challenge with civil service is the residency requirements. Um, the town that the um, applicant actually lives in has automatic preference. So uh, um, they said, the um, chief said, uh, they have to list um, three towns that they'd be willing to serve in. Um, so if Arlington happened to be one of them, but the person say lived in Belmont and Belmont had an opening, then Belmont would get the preference for that person. And then civil service also requires that officers live within uh, 10 miles of the town they would serve. So many towns have uh, over the last few years left civil service, it's around 40 so far. Uh, I've listed some of them. Uh, for us to leave civil service, I went through this last year, but just as a refresher, um, to leave civil service, either the town has to bargain with the unions or the town manager could pr um, uh, propose a warrant article uh, that the town meeting could then approve. Um, and if Arlington left civil service, then it conduct, could conduct its own exams, recruiting, job requirements, and so on. Um, you heard Sandy talk about it uh, last week. So it's uh, clear it's under increasing consideration, but they haven't uh, made any, haven't taken any formal action yet. Uh, what they're also finding from other towns um, is that it, it essentially does default to a collective bargaining issue. And in some cases, um, it's turned out to be um, you know, pretty expensive. I think, I think they said Lexington um, then negotiated, a, ended up having to negotiate a 4% increase. And there was one town, I don't remember what town, where uh, they ended up having to reinstate um, education benefits. Um, so the leaving can be expensive, but it could be, in the long run uh, to the extent that it um, improves the town's ability to um, recruit and retain um, uh, public safety personnel, it might be worth doing. So something to keep an eye on. Uh, and then the last slide is the uh, body cameras issue. Uh, this really hasn't changed much from last year. There's a couple of, uh, couple of updates, number five, uh, if you remember, they, uh, the police department got a, a grant from the state uh, executive office of uh, public safety and security uh, to fund software uh, that originally would have expired um, last June. Um, they got an extension to this June um, uh, because the, the, the funding is pending agreements with the, the unions. Um, they haven't purchased any equipment yet. Um, pending resolution of collective bargaining. The arbitration uh, also includes um, uh, uh, the, the cameras issue. And then, as I said earlier, the ranking officers, there doesn't seem to be a timeline for their negotiations. So um, not clear what's gonna happen there and then what's the impact on this state grant going to be. Um, so the town's policies, uh, 
intend to align, align with the state developed policy. Uh, the state was required to develop these policies, uh, which they um, uh, they released recommended re um, regulations on August last August second. And here's a link to them. I've also uh, put the uh, the recommended regulations on um, uh, our SharePoint site. So that is it. Um, what questions are there? And if um, you remember Darryl, the rule you... from last year, you can only ask questions that I know the answer to. So. <laughs> Daryl, can you make sure that Tara has um, a, a copy of your, your, your deck so that she can send it out to members? Yes, and I'll, I'll put it up on the SharePoint site too. Great, thank you. All right, um, questions. Um, Charlie. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, you answered the first question. I was wanting to hope. I was hoping that that uh, presentation would get up on SharePoint, so that's good. Do we know if the um, body cameras are going to be capital or operating expense? Um, it's actually going to be a mix of funding. There is there was no capital request this year for them. Um, number three, they've got funding out of um, their asset forfeiture fund to pay for the hardware. Um, they got uh, an amount of $47,000 from the town meeting, which I think was in 2021, uh, for maintenance. And then they have a $40,000 grant, that one that um, uh, would expire in June uh, from the state for software. So that, that looks to be the funding sources. Thank you. Uh, Topher. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, First, I noticed that the uniform badges and gloves jumped a lot, up by almost 30%. Did they explain why? Uh, yes, they did. That's the down here. That's the $25,000. Oh, I'm sorry. For the bulletproof. And I'm sorry. Oh, for the vest. Okay, okay, sorry about that. The bulletproof vest. Yeah, bulletproof vest. Okay. Yeah. And the other is, um, I'm not sure quite how the money works with this. So the, I believe the town is getting sued over the actions of an officer. And just how does that work in terms of both the legal expenses around that, as well as any settlement that might happen? Um, I will defer to people on the committee that might know more about how we handle things like that than I do. I think there is a settlements fund, isn't there? Um, there's a settlements fund and we also have insurance. So, Okay, so that's if there's a settlement. Yes. And what about legal costs just, you know, leading up to that, hopefully avoiding that? Um, if that maybe in a different budget. Maybe in a different budget. Um, okay. We need to be doing this with in-house lawyers or out-of-house lawyers, and the out-of-house lawyers would appear in the legal budget. And then the in-house lawyers would be covered by salaries for the in-house lawyers. Okay. All right. Thank you. Dave, your hand is up. You're, you're muted, Dave. I just have a comment uh, for Daryl. Daryl, just a historical thing. Many years ago, there was a, a, a lot of police officers in Arlington um, transferred year after year to the Arlington Fire Department. Uh, oh, but, okay. Yeah, for some reason, I don't know why um, that was going on. It didn't last maybe two to three years. You'd have one or two year transfer. Uh, the other question I, I do have is on, on the, um, the cameras, that's only for patrol officers. Am I correct on that? Or do you know? Um, I believe so. Okay, so I, I see... The, being a former police officer, the public has an idea that every police officer out in the street is going to have a camera, and that that's really incorrect. It's only the patrol officers that are on patrol each shift. So, so if you have detectives, they wouldn't have cameras, and personnel that work in administration, they wouldn't have cameras. Mm -hmm. Only only the patrol officers. And I don't know. I could be. I just don't know whether the sergeant's a supervisor on the street would have a camera or not, I'm not sure. Um, I can, I can uh, follow up with the chief on that. 
Yeah, it's it's just that I, you know the public at large they have an idea that everybody's wearing a camera, and that's that's really incorrect. It's the patrol officers that will have the cameras because they're the ones that have the most interaction on a daily basis with the people on the street. So that, that was just a couple of comments, and that's all, that's all I have to say. <laughs> Thank you, Dave. Um, Sophie, your hands up. Yes. Um, the first comment is in response to the question earlier. The the lawsuit with the involving the police department is covered in the legal budget, and the response we got was that so far they don't need any additional funds um, related to that. So it's it's covered in budget. And then just a question on question on um, the ten thousand for the training for the succession training for the chief's position. Is this something we've typically done, and is this spent? for one person or several people and do we i mean does that mean they already know who the next person is um, and what if that person so that, that was actually that was actually something um uh we, we asked um the this ten thousand dollars is for one person and you know our response was that kind of makes it clear who the who the next police chief is going, going to be um so they are um they are trying to get funding for a second person. Um, it's still a little. Uh, yeah, Daryl, did the chief mention a uh, a grant? Yeah, connection with that second one. Yes. Is there a commitment from those receiving this training that they're going to be staying on with Arlington, or can they get the training and move somewhere else? Uh, we didn't ask that. Um, I can. I mean, I, I don't know what others my, think. My, but... my assumption would be that if they're, if they believe they're in line for the position, they'll be committing. But and obviously, they can't be required to take it. I don't know what provisions they would be if they. Obviously, one of these people is not going to get the. At least one of these people isn't going to get the position. So, Daryl, um, if I may, what is the time frame for hiring a new, or what, what's the time frame for Chief Flaherty retiring? She said over the next year or so. And if we don't have someone um, in line, when she does, there'll likely be some interim or acting. I would think so. Police chief. She was this, when uh, Chief Ryan left. This training might be of use for that, if anything else. Um, right. Sophie, do you have any other questions? Um, no. I, I well, I guess the follow-up question is: Is she, did she individually pick who this person is, or who who normally makes that decision of who the next police chief is? Um, well, select it's board. normally the uh, select board. The select board, yeah. Right. So, are they deciding who gets the training, or is she deciding? I, I don't know. You want me to ask? I, I'm curious, but <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> Anything else, Sophie? Shame. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, Christine, and thanks, Daryl, for the presentation. Uh, two, two questions. Of uh, one is, uh, overtime is six fifty nine budgeted, but we spent over a million uh, actual in twenty two. So, do we think that's going to be enough? And then the um, second question is about obviously somebody who's been through a hiring process before. It's obviously very frustrating for the department to get all the way there. Is there a uniform process about vaccinations for the police department? Um, so those are my questions. Thank you. Um, so the answer to the first is uh, a lot of the overtime is driven by the vacancies. Um, so I would expect the the uh, the twenty four, well the you know the two budgeted numbers when the actuals come in, I would expect those will be higher because they're they've had chronic vacancies. Um, 
on the vaccinations, I believe there's a there's a town policy, isn't there? I, I don't know. I just I just it, maybe that's they should consider putting that in the posting <laughs> at the very least, right? Because uh, it's a lot of work for. Yeah, that, the, that's a good point. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah my a, impression from sitting in at the meeting was that uh, the vaccine, the prospective candidate not getting vaccinated was a uh, was would disqualify her from the position. So it, I, it sounded like it was policy. But I think it's town policy, not department policy. And I don't know if the town has a, a religious exemption. I don't know, yeah. And I don't know what the state does. So. Any other questions, Shane? I'm good. Uh, Dave. I just wanted to, um, going back to the chief's position, in the last ranking officer's contract, we lost you, Dave. We still can't hear you, Dave. No, I'm not sure he's muted. I don't know. He's not. He's not muted. Okay, there you go. Am I back? You're back, Dave. For some reason, this only kicks out when I talk. <laughs> So um, the, the chief of police's position in um, the next chief will be from the ranks of the current police department. That, 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 that's, an, that's in the, the, the current contract of the ranking offices, which allowed the, uh, the management to do away with civil service. Um, there was no argument from the ranking officers after a negotiated settlement. That's number one. I, I can't remember the other question that somebody had about the police. I, I, I don't know. I, um, I'll, I'll, um, There's a question about the training and I, I guess. The vaccines maybe? Well, yeah. Um, well, what would happen there on the training, it, it, this is something new, I guess. But um, when I say that, that, that the next, Chief will become come from the ranks. That could be that could be captains, lieutenants, or even a sergeant. So that's that's the ranks, um, and, and it, it could come out of that. So that, that's what that's what they agreed upon. So that this training is something new, and I'm surprised that um, Chief Flaherty mentioned that that she's considering retiring a year and a half from now. Usually that's they keep that close to the to the vest if you do, but um, unless you want succession planning, yeah, yeah. you want people to That's step right. up and. Right. It, I I think it's a good idea. Um, going back to appointment of the chief, the appointment of the chief of, of police now because it's not in civil service, the appointment is the town manager, and with approval of the board of selectmen. So the town manager appoints the chief of police. And with the approval of the board. Thank you for correcting okay. that, Dave. All righty. That's it. Thank you. Brian, you have your hand up. Um, <coughs> Harvey, quick question on the bulletproof vests moving from the capital budget to the operating budget. Is that a rotational item? I assume that's not for the whole department all at once and then it lasts five years and they replace them along those lines, or is this an annual event? There is there is a replacement um, cycle. It's not replacing all of them. I I'm trying to remember if they brought it up in the capital request, and I don't remember. I can look if if you want, Brian. Well, I don't need you. Don't need to be specific. I'm not going to not vote for it because of that. I'm just curious if this is going to be twenty five thousand every year, or thirty thousand every year going up forward, and they would say rotate it at once every five years, and it says that. The best is good. They're going to do twenty percent yeah. of the department now, et cetera, et cetera. There is a designated lifespan of the vest. I just don't remember what it is. And okay. as to as to whether this will, you know, permanently be in operating versus capital, I, I you know, there's always this tension between the two budgets. Um, oh, yeah. Capital wants to get stuff out of into operating, and operating, in some cases, wants to push stuff into capital. My understanding is that. Um, 
the expectation is that this will be the permanent um, okay. Thank funding you. source, but who knows, next year there's operating budget constraints, then it might get revisited. Okay, no problem. Thanks a lot. Daryl, did you say that the, that the police department had a capital request for these vests? They and did through the through the machinations to balance the capital budget. Um, uh, it was agreed that it would get moved to the operating budget, which accounts for the twenty five thousand dollar increase. Do you, uh, this might be a question more for when capital planning presents, but have was there any similar shifting in a? Uh, there, there was uh, an, a shift for IT. I think those were the only two. Brian, your hand is still up. Are you finished? Do you have another question? All right, guess not. All right, Josh, you have a question? Yeah, uh, thank you for uh, fixing the error there in the column for 22 actuals. And maybe you've already answered this. I may have missed it. But in terms of some of the lines which have much lower actuals than the 23 or 24 budget is, is that just, um, you know, a way of putting a little extra buffer in there or what would like on holiday pay I'm just looking at or <clears throat> injury earnings actually has nothing for 23 and 24. Um, those are, remember, 23 and 24 are budgeted items. Um, it really right. depends. Why, on why would why would you budget two hundred and twenty five thousand when you only spent one hundred and eighty thousand or whatever for the past two years? For injury earnings, they haven't budgeted. Well, anything. no, I'm look, I'm looking at holiday pay. So I can answer that if you like. Sure. Um. So part of what happens is that at the the changeover of the year, mm -hmm. okay, sometimes money is encumbered but it's not yet spent it's yet to be spent and so sometimes that explains that differential that the actuals don't actually reflect everything that you obligated yourself to spend in that fiscal year because some of that money is being held over to pay bills that are yet to come in but that you've already incurred do, i don't do know they, if that do, explains um like court time here where there's a big gap um but you know it it sort of explains some of the other lines where look, this will seem a little low, but it's probably not because it's going to get spent. Um, well, do, do they try and accrue for those things or is it just? Uh, no, they're they not allowed to accrue, Josh. Well, no, but I, if they have a, a, a service that's been rendered, but the invoice hasn't been paid, they're not allowed. Yeah, to. That's that's not so much accrual as it's what we call encumbrance. OK, well, another word for it, but so they, the, they do, the, the the court time issue was a COVID issue. That that's why the actuals for twenty one and twenty two are so low. Back up. Okay. Um, budget would be. And then for the holiday pay, remember there's there's been significant number of vacancies, um, and obviously if the position, excuse me, I have to get a cap off my desk. Um, if there's a you know vacancy, that person's not. Um, that position is not accruing the uh, holiday pay, but um, I would imagine they have to assume that um, you know those positions are going to get filled through the year, so mm -hmm. they need to account for. Mm -hmm. I mean, I guess it's just as as someone new to kind of look at these budgets this carefully, it, it would appear to me that we're obviously just picking up the same number for twenty four as twenty three, and maybe twenty maybe those numbers didn't even reflect actuality from earlier years. And so I, I just don't know if they if they're trying to kind of mm -hmm. how accurate people are trying to be. So that was just a question. And then on the on the body camera question, I would anticipate the town meeting <clears throat> is going to be somewhat concerned that that's been kind of lingering for a couple of years. And with kind of just the general mood in the in the country, I think there will be a question as to what what's holding that up. I know that, that uh, the manager in, indicated that it's a, a bargaining issue, but uh, do you that's, have a well, sense that's what's holding it up? Yes. It is it is a bargainable issue, and they can't move until they've bargained up and agreed. 
unions have agreed. So that that is what's holding it up. Right. Okay. Do, do you have a sense that they that they have the perception from both the management and the union side that it just doesn't look good from a optics perspective? Um, I'm not sure that's a motivating factor. Okay. Thank you. That's it. Uh, Daryl, didn't you say earlier that the unions were were seemed receptive, but they were just it's just a bar like yeah, any they, issue if it's you know they 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 seem receptive, but you know collective bargaining is what it is, and they're going to try to get what they can out of it. Dean? I don't, I don't have a question as much as I, I do want to make kind of a historic observation of the budget for um, newer members. Because, you know, Josh, you, you actually hit on the question, I think, or uh, the frustration every new member has had with the, both the police and fire budget. And it, it's interesting because it's when you're on the um, when you're on the committee for a lot of years, you start to become comfortable with it. And, and essentially what's happening is, if I just repeat history, because we've debated this a lot, is how do you, when you when you build a police and, or fire budget, do you assume a vacancy rate, right? Because what, what, or do you not assume a vacancy rate? So in our budget, police and fire, the chiefs go ahead and they assume no vacancies. They assume all the positions are staffed knowing that there's gonna be vacancies. And what's unique about the public safety budgets versus the general government budgets is the lead time to replace. And so like take another big budget, the school budget. So if a teacher were to retire on the last day of school, June 30th, there's a break of, you know, all of July, all of August, and come up September 1, there will be another teacher in the seat, right? There'll be a new teacher or whatever. Um, but with police, it's different because if somebody retires, position goes vacant, you have to go through this process that Dave McKenna articulated. You hire someone, you send them to the academy, they come back, it's, it's, a, it's a run rate and, or a vacancy run. And while they're, they're, that vacancy is occurring, you have to, um, you have to hide, you have to, you have to cover those ships, you can't go without them, right? And so we've always debated how to do this. Like you assume if you're running at a 5%, 6% patrol and vacancy rate that you just budget in it, or do you not? And I think what we've come back to after like circling around and around and researching and having study groups and things like that is this way of doing it here, while messy and like not, not perfect, because it does beg all the like great questions people have asked, which are all like perfectly normal questions. It, it just, it's better than the alternative of trying to estimate vacancy rates and then being wrong the other way. So that just like, sort of historic use. Thank you, Dean. Topher? Yeah, Dean, you just said something that sparked a question. So are you saying like when we hire in the police and fire department, we hire someone and then they get trained? Yes. A, okay. Yes. Okay. There's, they have to, and, and the, the classes in the academy are scheduled and not necessarily right right away no right you have to wait for the yeah. training to happen and do stuff okay i did not know that thank you john you have a hand up yeah i would maybe just note <clears throat> i imagine there's kind of some uh, interplay between the overtime and the salaries and wages like as dean mentioned they they're budgeted for full employment uh doesn't appear that they're going to hit full employment uh as a result the overtime I think, I think the chief even mentioned that the overtime is going to be higher than, is going to be closer to 20, 2023. Overtime is going to be closer to 2022 than it was at, than, you, than the 659 you see there. Uh, you know, is that an issue? I would think it's not an issue because there's going to be some excess in the salaries and wages. So I feel like those two kind of take care of each other a little bit in, 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 in the sense that they're not 100% accurate in the budget, but they kind of play off each other. Can I, Madam Chair, can I make one quick comment? Go ahead, Dean. Just, just trying to, just sort of a, on a, on a, on a, I think historically, I explained our, our, that with the, how the committees looked at it. The other thing we've always said to the public safety chiefs is 
you know, we give you a budget, right? We give you salaries. You look at that bottom line. Um, don't show up looking for a reserve tra fund transfer. Like manage your department, schedule people, do your job. We pay, you get paid for it. It's great. But, you know, don't come back looking for a transfer every year. Like 250, 300,000 is going to manage your money, right? And you're right. So, like, that, that salaries and overtime line might be crazy. Like, it might come way out of whack this year. It could be, like, 5.5 million of salaries. There's a big number of overtime. But we, we've we've historically held the chief accountable for delivering a balance. Yeah. Actual at the end of the year. And that's that's the that's the middle ground. Yeah. And I, I've worked in public sector my entire career. And, um, you know, it's okay to turn money back in at the end of the year. Not so okay to ask for money at the end of the year. So, um, Charlie? Thank you, Madam Chairman. I just w wanted to add one thing. There's another variable um, in this um, the salary vacancy account and uh, overtime issue, and that's uh, retirement. And some of the retirees, uh, I don't know if it's, uh, if it's also true in the police and fire, but some of the retirees in town accrue uh, a combination of vacation or sick time that they get upon retirement that also has to come out of the um, salary budget for that year. And it's pretty difficult for um, department managers to predict exactly uh, when these uh, retirements will occur. Which may raise a question as to Chief Flaherty, uh, when our time comes to retire, whether there's gonna be a payout needing, needed there. Anybody have any other questions, comments? So Daryl, do you have a recommendation for the Finance Committee? Yes, um, now I'm gonna ask an embarrassing question because I ask it every year. Am I moving the taxation total or adoption of the taxation total or the appropriation total? It's the taxation total, isn't it? Taxation yes. total. Okay. Um, so I'm going to move adoption of the uh, fiscal 24 taxation total of nine million ninety six thousand seven hundred seven hundred and fifty. Do I have second. a second? Second. Any other questions? Any discussion on the police department budget? Seeing no hands, we'll go. To a roll call vote. Those in favor of the proposed motion approving the budget as printed say yes or aye. Uh, Shane. Yes. Jennifer. Yes. Sophie. Yes. Brian. Yes. Carolyn? Rebecca? Yes. Josh? Yes. Grant? Yes. Charlie? Yes. John? Yes. Daryl? Yes. Annie? Yes. Ellen Jones? Yes. Topher? Yes. Peggy? Yes. El Tosti? Uh, yes. Dean? Yes. Dave? Yes. It is a unanimous vote. Approving the and, police department budget. And I apologize. I actually had on that slide about the uh, filling dispatcher position. I had it set up as a nice animation, which for some reason shows not to work. So. Thank you for your presentation. Daryl. Um, next is fire. John, are you ready? Yes. All right. Um, this is on. So I thought it was on page 122. 22 of the budget. <laughs> Right, take it away, John. 
So you guys can see my spreadsheet, right? Just yes. want to make sure. I, I have a couple screens here, so I just I get worried, you know, which one is uh, getting captured. So you see the spreadsheet that's moving. That's great. And then uh, I just want to check. Now do you see? Now you see the Word document. No. You, no. you still no. see the spreadsheet. Oh, no, right. you need you need to share your whole desktop and not just the. Yeah, I think I'll I think I'll unshare when I just go between the two. So I have, I have a spreadsheet and I have a Word document. Although I, I I will say I don't have any animation attempted or otherwise. <laughs> Probably a good move, John. Yeah, yeah. All right. So either way, so it sounds like you can see my spreadsheet, and I will start with that. Um. So the fire department is, uh, unlike the police department, the fire department is at full employment with uh, all 81 positions staffed, uh, which I thought was, you know, impressive because, you know, after listening to um, Chief Flaherty describe the, the challenges with civil service, uh, apparently Chief Kelly is able to uh, fill the ranks despite those challenges. Uh, but also makes for, I think, a little bit of a more clear cut uh, budget, just knowing that the positions are filled and, you know, you don't, uh, have to anticipate that interplay between the overtime that we were just uh, talking about. Um, the 23 budget and the 24 budget are, are quite similar, as you can see, you know, on page 122 in your budget books or here on my screen. Really, the uh, the big numbers that moved related almost entirely to a um, memorandum of understanding that was. Uh, effective July 1st of 2022 that I uh, just gave some bumps uh, to in a couple different items, really all of the items that you see movement in the school credit, the EMT um, stipend and the longevity, all that movement was a result of the, uh, the memorandum of understanding, which took effect in uh, July 1st of 2022. Uh, so I think the 2024 budget takes those numbers into um, into uh, account. Uh, so now I'm just going to head back over to my uh, Word document. And I think the best way to do that is to, uh, hold on. You can probably just drag it over to the same screen as the spreadsheet. I don't think you can. So that, I don't think you can. Because see, right now you still see the, the spreadsheet. Give me one second. I think I, I stop share and then I share again. So bear with me, I apologize. John, if you hold down control and select the Word document and the Excel spreadsheet, it should allow you to share them both. Really? Okay. And then now, now do you see the Word document? Yes. Okay, cool. Like I said, so th there's um, these are the items I just wanted to go over. I didn't put too much detail in these. I, I wasn't sure what was the appropriate thing to put in the presentation, so I kept it pretty high level. I certainly can put more in. Um, but these are the items that... Um, that I think are worth mentioning. So the ambulance offset. Uh, I actually provided footnotes to Alan over the weekend, and uh, those I actually also ran those footnotes past Chief Kelly, and he was in agreement. He thought that they were a pretty good summary of what happened with the ambulance offset. Uh, you know, I apologize they're not in this presentation, but I, I can just uh, describe what was in those footnotes. So there's two ambulance funds. One returns funds to the general fund. The other is a returns funds to a revolving fund. Um, and the the fund that uh, goes back to the general fund uh, gets the gets the money from uh, providing basic life services. Uh, the town of Arlington uh, provides almost 100% of the basic life services here in town. Um, and they continue to provide them and they historically have provided them. So there's really no change in who's providing those services. Uh, the amount of money that they're receiving for providing those services has gone up. Um, so as a result, the money going back into the general fund has gone up really just because the uh, reimbursement rates have gone up. So that's kind of the first thing that happened. More money going back into the general fund because the uh, reimbursement rates for providing basic life, life services has gone up. Then the second thing that happened was um, there's the advanced life support revolving fu revolving fund. So this is the um, this is the fund that just continues to kind of fund itself. 
from uh, billings to the ambulance services. This, there has been a change in who provides these services because of uh, the, the increased demand for those services through COVID and also the, uh, the difficulties in, in hiring people to fill those positions. The, uh, the department uh, gave a more central or direct role to Armstrong Ambulance. Uh, they, they basically said, if you uh, provide a dedicated ambulance to, to Arlington, then you can kind of be in charge of providing those services. The, the, the fire department still participates but um, but instead of it used to be the town of Arlington billed for those services and then would pay Armstrong Ambulance as appropriate. Now Arlington uh, Armstrong Ambulance uh, does the billing and they uh, they reimburse the town as as necessary. But the end result is um a a less money is coming back into the revolving fund. So. I think at first glance, it looks like a reclass. It looks like, oh, they're taking money from the revolving fund and put it into the general fund, but it's actually two independent moves. Um, and so that that was the first item that I wanted to mention. And Will, you'll see it on your budget. The only place that at least I see it on, in the budget page is down at the bottom, the uh, the offsets. There's, um, it, it, historically, the revolving fund was returning, you know, 211K, 213K, now it's down to budgeting just 100K. So that's down 113K. Um, and that's resulting from um, from the ALS fund uh, being, you know, Armstrong Ambulance taking a little bit more of a, uh, a, an involve, having a little bit more of an involvement in the, uh, the ALS services. That's the first item I wanted to mention. The second item is the, um, so there's this, I actually noticed this first when I, I did a, uh, I did a review of the fire receipts that were on the, uh, the public payment website that pretty much anyone can go to the town of Arlington's website and see all the different payments that were made out of, for each fund out of the entire town, which I'm sure you're all aware of. But uh, this, this expense actually did kind of catch my interest, 62606 uh, just public safety, hospital, medical care, not a lot of details to it. And it, it uh, didn't really have anything else comparable. Um, and then sure enough, the chief, Chief Kelly explained to us, we didn't even ask him, but he explained to us that um, the town was sent a bill for a uh, knee replacement surgery for a firefighter that retired 25 years ago. And um, uh, Chief Kelly was pretty surprised, but apparently the, uh, the retired firefighter mentioned that, you know, he was a fire department uh, employee and you know that's maybe where he injured his, his knee or maybe that was where he injured his knee so the um the insurance company sent the bill to the town of arlington and um I, I mean i don't know how much back and forth there was but but chief kelly seemed kind of surprised that you know he's getting hit with bills for a uh, uh, bill for employees that uh retired so, you know, decades ago and uh you'll see that number it's down in this uh so it's all the way back in the 2022 actual, and it's in this number. Actually, not, I forget that you guys can't see my spreadsheet, but it's down in that line 5257. If you have your um your budget books open and you go down to um account 5257, you'll see that in 2024, it's up to 95,274. The hospital and medical medical care is up to 95,274. And uh, the bulk of it is at sixty-two thousand. So, uh, Chief Kelly just mentioned it that it's um, something that that um, you know, obviously he didn't anticipate. He hopes that it's it's nothing that he he knows any way he can prepare for. Um, the next item I wanted to mention is now I'm actually going to go back to my budget. So I'm gonna I'm gonna. Uh, Stop share and then share screen. Yeah, so okay. So number third, number uh, three on my uh, master budget is the, the of the items I wanted to discuss was the uh, the master budget versus the payroll detail. And um, so all the items in salaries, which you know clearly makes up the bulk of the fire department's budget, all of the items under salaries was supported by pretty um, detailed spreadsheets. And uh, 
and I thought that I keep asking, but you guys can see like when I flip over to these detailed spreadsheets, you guys can see that, right? Yeah, okay, cool. Yes, yes. All right, excellent. So, um, so as I said, I think that's a good thing that, you know, these numbers were all uh, supported by pretty, pretty uh, detailed, you know, to, to the level of, of actual employee, what, uh, what each employee is, is expected to receive. Uh, there were some differences when you compare the budget here on page one with the, um, the detail. You know, it's nice that they provided the detail and, and in the most part, for the most part, the detail was spot on. There are a few differences. And actually, Alan reached out over the weekend regarding one of them, and it was this top line. They're budgeting 67, six, $6,709,000 of the detail showed um, six million. Well, actually, I'm going to unhide this column here. Uh, column F is what the payroll detail provided. And Alan sent me an email over the weekend just noticing that the detail uh, supported six six million seven hundred six thousand. So we asked if we could, you know, identify the the missing three thousand two hundred forty two, which was a great question. And uh, I did get a little bit of, uh, you know, I learned a little bit more about it, but I haven't quite fully resolved it. But in, you know, looking in that, I figured if I'm going to ask about the 3242, I should also ask about the 15,000, which is the difference in the school credit, and the 26,000, which is in the difference in the EMT pay, the EMT defibrillator pay. Um, so, you know, there's three, there's, uh, and then also the, um, yeah, so the longevity, the longevity is pretty much, you know, $100, $102 difference. We'll call that pretty much spot on. The overtime is spot on. Um, really just the, um, it's really the EMT is the big one. And then the three, the, uh, the, the 3,200 up, up at the top and the, uh, the school credit. So all in, you got a, a discrepancy of 3,200, 15,000 and 26,000. So I actually sent those out to, um, I sent that out last night to chief Kelly and also to, um, to the, the budget department. And Chief Kelly called me up this morning and said that, you know, he kind of knew what they were. And I said, that's great. If you guys can just send me back some, uh, you know, confirmation. Yeah, I didn't get the confirmation back, but, you know, I guess, I don't know if we have any thoughts on, it is a budget, it is a forecast. So, you know, it's all right. Obviously, these aren't exact numbers because they haven't occurred yet. But there's there's a little bit of a discrepancy between the detail and the, um, and the budgeted amounts. Uh, but I don't know if, you know, we may want to wait to hear back or we can just go with the budgeted amounts. Um, but that's just one other item that I wanted to bring up. Um, now I'm going to flip back to my uh, my Word document, finish this up here. All right, so back to my Word document, right? Um, so, and... Again, as you can see on the budget detail, if you have that open, the uh, the the biggest increase for the year is in the EMT um, defibrillator pay uh, account number five one one seven. It's going up by one hundred thirty seven thousand this year, and that's that's really just a formula driven by the uh, memorandum of understanding, which which took effect July first of twenty twenty two. Everyone is qualified as an EMT gets a 5% of their salary for FY23 and 5.5% in FY24. So it's, it's, I believe it's contractual. It's, it's a formula. It is what it is. So it's, you know, it's a big increase, but that's what's driving it. Um, and then I uh, just mentioned the OT. Chief Kelly did say that the OT is trending downward this year. Uh, again, just looking at the actuals to budget, uh, if you go all the way back to 2021, the actual was uh, 669K. Then it jumped way up to a million fifteen in 2022. I assume there were some vacancies back then. Um, now, the last two years, they've budgeted uh, 473K. And uh, Chief Kelly did say that they're actually on track to, to not exceed that overtime budget. So that's kind of what I was thinking earlier when, uh, when Daryl was talking about the police OT they probably will exceed their OT because they have vacancy. Whereas uh, according to Chief Kelly, they they should not exceed their OT again because they don't have vacancy. So um, 
although Chief Kelly did make one, I thought it was a pretty good point. He mentioned that, um, you know, anytime uh, the the uh, the firefighters get a bump in pay, whether it's a percentage driven by an agreement or memorandum of understanding, anytime the base pay goes up, he you know, he he pointed out that in theory everything should go up by the same percentage for the budget. Uh, but so yeah, I guess he he felt that it doesn't always go up the budget the budgeted amount doesn't always go up by the same percentage. But he just wanted to point out that it should. Uh, you know, I, I, something I will keep an eye on. Um, and then the final item is which. Daryl, I don't know if you mentioned this, but it's it's I guess it, I'm sure it's a town wide thing is the maintenance budget for each department is decreasing. We actually heard a lot of the same stuff from the police department and the fire department saying that, uh, you know, in theory, they are no longer responsible for the exterior of their buildings. Uh, so they are budgeting less money for the uh, for the maintenance of their buildings. As you can see down in account 5202, it went from. Um, it, it went from 43k was the actual 2022, but they're only budgeting 20,000 going forward. Um, but I think both the police department and the fire department, you know, noted that there was a little bit of a, maybe some tension on, you know, what's what's capital, what isn't. But um, they said that they, you know, they they still continue to be responsible for what what's inside the building, and they understood that. But sometimes maybe there's some, um, you know, it's not clear cut. And the one example the chief did note was, um, and this is a current year, so this is an FY23 item, is that there's a crack in the in the garage. There's a crack in the, the flooring of the uh, station downtown, and they had an engineer come in and look at it just because they wanted to make sure that the crack, you know, wasn't driven by the, the engines or it wasn't going to get worse or if there's anything they should do to keep it from getting worse. And the engineer that came in charged a certain amount of money. I think it was about uh, a couple thousand dollars, and uh, the ch the chief was informed that that's that's you know maintenance for the department to handle. So I don't know what the right answer, but that was just an example of something that he he wanted to to say. You know, um, they are continuing to keep an eye on. So those are the the items I wanted to mention, and so I didn't put it all into one clean document. That's what I'll do uh, for my next presentation. But I at least I. I hit the points I wanted to make. So with that, I guess I'll throw it out for questions. Uh, I just wanna clarify something, John. So sure. there, you're saying that there are some discrepancies in the salary and wages line, the school credit line and the EMT yes. pay line? Yep, and um, and I'll go back to my uh, spreadsheet so we can talk numbers here. And, and can you go over again, what, what what's the amount of, yep, yep. what amounts are we talking about? So right here, and I, I sent these exact numbers out to, uh, and I'm actually going to pull my email real quick. So, um, yeah, I sent these out to Julie and to uh, to Chief Kelly last night, and the numbers are, uh, you know, 3242 right here. I'll make them yellow, too, so it's, you know, 3242. You can't see your screen. Oh, you can't see the Excel spreadsheet? My oh, you're not sure. Now you can, right? Yes. 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 I'm going to make them yellow. These are the discrepancies here: thirty-two, forty-two, and um, fifteen, four, eight, three, twenty-five, sixteen, and then one hundred two. So these numbers, and you know, I think yeah, these are included in the master budget, so everybody sees these these numbers. So that when I say payroll detail, this is what I'm referring to. Um, so, okay, Christine, the, if I can comment on that. Yeah, go ahead, Alan. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. And the the, the numbers aren't very big, and these uh, this level of detail isn't something that we you know, write up in the report for a vote to town meeting. But, you know, the, the the budget book that we get from the manager is really a combination of two spreadsheets. There's a, you know, detailed salary spreadsheets and, a, and the detailed master budget spreadsheet. The master budget spreadsheet is what sort of length of the long range plan. 
And there are very often there are discrepancies between those two, um, just because they're not linked together and one's updated and they forget to update the other one. Usually not a big deal. But in the finance committee report, we put the you know, total budgets that are voted by town meeting and the expense and salary bottom lines on the same page and they have to add up. So if whenever I see something where the salary details in the budget don't match the salary lines in the summary, that's like a page one of each budget, I, I have to resolve that um, just because we need to, they need to match in the finance committee report. Um, and usually what that ends up is going back to uh, the, the, the town manager or CFO and they, they resolve with some sort of typo. It's probably the master, but the page one that is correct. But whenever the discrepancy, we just need to resolve it. So we know what, what the bottom line, there was the details are not shown to town meeting, but the bottom lines have to match. They have to vote on something. So that's, that's why we have to, you know, do this resolution. And then we can't really vote on it unless we, you know, make an assumption that the page one of the budget is correct. I um, I am not inclined to want to vote this budget tonight until we get that information. Having said that, however, putting aside these numbers, I think we can, um, if anyone has questions or further discussion about other items, let's do that so that when it comes back up, hopefully we can vote on this budget on, on Wednesday night, um, but um, putting putting the reconciliation of these numbers aside, do people have questions on the fire department budget? Shane. Thank you, Christine, and thank you, John, uh, for that presentation. T two questions. Um, one is um, this memorandum, I guess I'm used to hearing like collective bargaining, so, Curious why we entered into this memorandum of understanding and uh, number one and number two, as um, Jennifer's with me and Jordan are we we're working on the facilities department budget. So um, sort of just curious if there was anything else the chief had said about, you know, this, this crack in the floor and whether this is a facilities department or DPW thing that should be addressed. And um, yeah, I, I, I guess. Oh, so I think the, the my takeaway was that the, that the fire department had to pay for the consulting for the engineer to review it. As far as the conclusion of the engineer, uh, I'm not even sure it was it was it was 100% available. Maybe maybe they're still waiting to hear back from the engineer. So maybe just something to keep an eye on. Yeah, I don't know what the conclusion is. I did see the crack, but yeah, I don't think they've heard back the official uh, analysis. Okay, and, and then the memorandum of understanding, I guess, like yeah, yeah, sure. So yeah, uh, cool. I, I, the memorandum of understanding is out on SharePoint, and I found it to be very helpful and you know surprisingly easy to read. Uh, the numbers are you know it's only about four pages. Uh, why it was signed, I, you know, I'd have to defer to someone else. There might be some language above. I think in the first paragraph there is some language saying that um, you know as they continue to negotiate their agreement they will um they will consider this memorandum of understanding um they will you know to me it seems like it's kind of a, um as as collective bargaining drags on you know just to get the the employees to continue to show up for work every day you got to have like a a partial agreement but again i will have to defer to someone else on the rationale of uh, signing the memorandum of under of of understanding I can pull it up because um well uh, i can if, if um i can find it in sharepoint and i can take a look yeah i guess it just yeah i'm so used to hearing collective bargaining and i guess yeah if we're if we're well, getting you know collective the... bargaining agreement is probably normally you know tens and 20 30 40 50 yeah. pages probably very difficult to read this was four pages so um you know why the town opted for this yeah i don't, I don't know I, i'll take a look at the agreement yeah. Thanks, Tara. Other questions, Topher. Yes, thank you. Um, thank you both for the presentation, John. Um, I was just curious, what is out of grade pay? The 5119? Yeah. Um, I would I would have to look into that. I'm not sure. I see it's you know it's budgeted for 9500. Out of grade pay, 
Madam Chair, our great pay is the concept of an employee filling a vacancy at a job grade above their normal job grade. So I do not proclaim to know the ranks of the fire department, but historically out of great pay is if you're one job level and you're covering a higher job level, you get paid at the higher job. Yeah, know. that makes sense to me. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but I, I didn't confirm that, but it makes perfect sense to me. Yeah, then that, that does jive. Um, my other question was on 5114 and injury earnings and just I may mean, have missed this in the police budget, but those are fairly big numbers and we don't budget anything. I'm just curious as to, I mean, I know it could be hard to predict injuries, but we don't budget anything for those, that category. Yeah, I don't know if that's an insurance issue, whereas maybe the insurance would be picking it up at a certain point, maybe a workers comp type issue. Um, wasn't the hospital and medical care line cover that? 5257? Well, I guess though, it, but it comes out of actuals, so, right. Madam Chair? Yes, go ahead, remember, go ahead, Dean. If I remember correctly, the town of Arlington is self-insured for workers' compensation, that's why it's going to our um, insurance budget, you'll see large numbers for workers comp. Um, so even though workers comp pay is like I think like, like 70 percent or something like that of regular earnings, um, it still has to it has to come out of the department. And um and so this goes back to that same concept I mentioned earlier. Like, you know, if we have an if we have an employee and they're being paid out of the first line, 5170 salaries and wages, and then they get injured. We have to pay the carrier who then pays the employee. How do we budget for that? Historically, we've assumed nobody's going to be injured. And when they are, it causes a reduction in salaries and wages and an increase in wages. Does that answer the question for you, Tofa? For now, yeah. Okay. Anything else, Tofa? No, that's it. Dave McKenna. Uh, just a point of uh, point of information. Uh, both, the, both the police and the fire departments, they really don't have what we call other departments, the workman's comp. It's a different form. It's called line of duty injury, where a police officer or a firefighter, if they're injured on the job, their salary is paid in full. Paid in full. Um, all the time that they're out. It's so part of that, this this question, it comes, it, it's coming out of their salary, but the salary is paid in full minus no taxes. So that's police and fire only. And it's, it's, it's called line of duty injury. Now, I'm just curious that that's, that's, now would that come out of like the fire budget or would that come out of the, like a, a different, like a general fund? Come out it would come out of the, to my knowledge, it would come yeah. out of the fire budget until such time as they deem whether they're going to retire the fellow or the, or the individual, or stuff like that. Got it. So, and I'm just thinking out loud here, I apologize, but uh, so I assume, let's just say someone does, because the, actually the, the, the um, Chief Kelly did mention that, you know, in the past year, eight, eight, eight employees were out on extended sick leave, five employees were out on injury leave. 30 employees were out at different times on COVID leave. He had mentioned that to me. Um, now, the way I see the budget working is, okay, those guys continue to get their salary. Those salaries are budgeted. So that's not going to really move the needle here. That's not really going to move much because they're just getting paid what they anticipated they would be getting paid. Uh, however, whoever has to replace them, if someone has to, that, that might drive the OT or maybe, the, maybe it's almost like a subset of the OT, but I can look into that. But I would think the general salary line is going to stay pretty, you know, pretty uh, stable there. It, it it does draw it does draw the um, the OT accounts. Yeah, it would impact those. Yeah, I imagine it, it does impact them. But but I can only tell in the police department if you have somebody. Like I'll give an example. They have a, a an individual presently has been out line of duty for over a year, and. The town, the town side, they recognize that, and, and they've been trying to resolve the issue of whether or not that employee is going to come back to work, 
or take a disability yep. pension. And that's that's out there someplace right now. And then maybe just so from my understanding, so would that person be listed you know, as an employee receiving a salary in the detail that we're kind of looking at? Yes. Got it. Got it. That's what that would have been my understanding too. Thank yeah. you. Sorry, I'm the one asking. I'm supposed to be the one answering the questions right now. I'm asking questions, but thank it you. May be, it may be possible that the 5114 line item is an accounting line to, to yeah. keep track of yeah. this. So that is why there wouldn't be an, a budgeted amount. Because you can't budget for it, number one, but it's yeah. just to keep track of how much is spent. Got it. So it's historical. Dean? So I may end up saying this um, when every new member presents, but John, I think you did a really good job. So yeah. it's a, get a budget, it's got a lot to it. Thanks, Dean. Really, I think you really did. Yeah. Good job. I, I concur. Thank you. Any other questions about the fire department budget? All right, as I said, we won't vote on the fire department budget tonight. Hopefully we'll vote on it on Wednesday. We'll just, um, John, it, hopefully by then you can explain the differentials in these three and four counts. Um, and then we'll just go right to a vote unless people have questions about the information that you're gonna get. If you have anything that you can share with the, with the, with the, um, committee between now and Wednesday, if you get any information from, yep. from the chief or Julie, please um, send it to us or give it to Tara to send it to us, all right? Yes, certainly. All right, um, so we will um, wait until Wednesday to take a vote on the fire department budget. And Daryl, did you say inspections? Um, we'll have to hold off on that. Uh, yeah, I'm waiting to hear back from uh, Mike Champa on the on schedule in the meeting. Okay. All right. Well, then let's go to Annie and your budgets. Okay. So um, here's how we're going to do this. Um, Rebecca and I are presenting on recreation, Edburn's Arena, the libraries, um, health and human services, including all the sub departments, AYCC, and the Council on Aging Transportation Enterprise. Fund. So essentially all enterprise funds other than the um, water and sewer and the whole health and human services budget and the library's budget. But we're going to do this in this order. I'm going to talk you through uh, recreation and rink, and then Rebecca will do the libraries, and then we'll flip over to um, health and human services, and I'll cover that and the Council on Aging Transportation Enterprise Fund, and then Rebecca will do AYCC. I do not expect us to get through all of this in the next hour, but I just wanted to give you the lineup so you know what we're doing. Rebecca, do you want to contradict me at all? No, that sounds great. Okay, so let me get where I want to be, which is on the recreation budget. All right, I did not uh, prepare any kind of spreadsheets or anything for this budget because um, there's a bunch of stuff about an enterprise fund that is pretty straightforward. So the enterprise fund is usually, what we're trying to do is to see what the expenses are and then what the revenues are, and we're asking that fund to be in balance. And it is essentially self-contained. So all of the expenses have to be covered by the revenue earned within the enterprise fund. Um, so for recreation, for example, you will see that everything here is earned. This line transfer from general fund, if we are sending some money from the general fund to the enterprise fund, it will show up as either transfer from general fund or transfer from other funds, depending on whether or not the accounting department has gotten to fixing it. Um, and you can see the recreation budget is not accepting any funds from the um, general fund this year. They're not asking for anything. Um, these are the expenses. Unlike a lot of budgets that you will see, they do not split the salaries and the expenses. We're just sort of running down the side. 
Um, what Joe has done over time is that he has tried to budget uh, based on his programming here, what the expenses will be. Um, they do run an after school care program. And so that's this set of expenses. Um, and let's see if there's anything else. And then, then the kids after care and preschool salaries. And then pretty much they do the same things with salaries. So revenue, reservoir staffing, summer program salaries, reservoir beach salaries, these are all separated out. Um, but the full-time um, uh, employees are represented in salaries and wages. So let's go look at the salary detail, which we do have. Um, recreation did add one position. This is a shared position with the rink. Obviously, there's a lot of things that the rink and um, the uh, recreation department chair. Um, so this is an off-hour supervisor, which is basically somebody to be managing when outside of regular town office hours. So um, it's they use a lot of young people for things, so on and so forth. And I believe that person is intended to just be, you know, an adult supervisor available at those off-hour times. Um, you'll see that the director of recreation is charged 0.8 to the recreation budget, and then the other 0.2 shows up in the rink, which you will see a little later. So. Um, let me just pull some things out here. Okay. Um, the if we start at the top here, one of our questions was about the salary and wages temp. This was something that Joe had originally budgeted, like rolled into other things last year, but it's bringing back into the budget. So it's really just a repeat of a line that existed. It's a uh, dog park supervisor stipend and a few other things like that that are just miscellaneous small salaries that are not full-time year-round positions. Um, there was a big jump in reservoir supplies here. And the major explanation for that was it's two things. One is that he's rolled chlorine for the reservation, for the, res the reservoir into that budget instead of budgeting it separately. And the other is that he's added $25,000 for maintenance of the new landscaping at the reservoir um, that, that concerned about DPW capacity and doesn't want to lose um, ground on that landscaping. So he's added some money to his budget for that. Um, most of the rest of these things are increase in program costs, which are covered by increases in, in program revenue. He's raising fees this year, um, changing scheduling a little bit for some of the summer programs. And he believes that will be more cost effective and that the revenue will cover. Uh, okay. And then these are his revenue estimates. We did ask him how good he feels about these revenue estimates and he's feeling pretty good about them. Um, he thinks between the increase in fees and the increasing need for the programming that um, he will make these numbers. Because this is an enterprise fund, it has retained earnings at the end of the year. It keeps the money that it earned and didn't spend. Currently in the recreation um, enterprise fund, the retained earnings is $1.1 million. And Joe is going to pull out 200,000 of that to support his revenue budget next year. You can see he normally budgets about 100,000. He doesn't always use it. But in this case, the preschool that the recreation department runs is going to move into the parmenter school once the program currently there that will go back to the high school can move back to the high school. And he's pulled out some money to do some retrofitting in the parmenter because they're going to move the preschool in there because it will save him a big chunk on rent. He's now renting a commercial building and he wants to stop doing that. Um, so those are kind of the highlights of what's going on with recreation. Do people have questions about recreation? Alan, what's your question? Um, well, the question goes back to the off hours um, uh -huh. supervisor. That's, I, I believe that's a new line item. 
It is. Uh, and whenever there's a new position, I like to put a footnote yeah. in the report, just you yeah. know, a one liner why. So you know, it can you give me a, a one liner that that justifies you know why it's a new position it hasn't been in the budget previously. Let me let me look at Rebecca's notes really quick and see if she did a better job of notating this than I did. Um, off our supervisor. It may be that there's always been a supervisor and they just pulled it out for transparency and it no, used to be in a different budget so. or maybe a brand new position. It, no, I think it's actually an added position. Okay. And I remember us talking about this, but I'm not sure. Um, let me get back to you on a footnote on that, but it okay. is a position and it is related to making sure that things are well managed in off hours. Okay, thank you. And, and then I just wanted to make a uh, point since this is the first enterprise fund. Um, each enterprise fund has a health insurance uh, number as a line item in their expenses. And mm -hmm. The, if when we get to the insurance budget, you'll see an offset of like six hundred ninety-six thousand dollars. Part of what I do is I take the offs is take the uh, expense lines from the enterprise funds, including both water and sewer, and add them up. And if they don't add up to the same number as that offset in health insurance, then somebody's going to get questions. So while you're doing uh, the enterprise funds, just double check those numbers and make sure that they're they're built into the offset in the insurance budget. Okay, I mean, you. do you want do you want that done before we vote, Alan, or are you just suggesting? No, no. Well, I, 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 we'll need to resolve them before we vote the insurance budget. But if okay. if the numbers from the enterprise funds add up to a different number, then we're going to have a problem with the insurance budget. Okay, that makes sense. So it's just it, it's a heads up. Cool. Thank you, Brian. Else, Alan? Uh, yeah, I have a quick question. Uh, you said there's one point one million in the retained earnings. How much is there in cash? In cash in the retained earnings? No, no. How much cash do they have? Retained earnings is one part of your balance sheet. Usually there's less cash available than the retained earnings. Otherwise, it'd be 1.1 million in cash if there was no other items on the um, balance sheet of the enterprise fund. Right. I'm not sure that we're using it, that. It's all, it's all cash. It's all cash. Yeah. We're not so there's 1.1 million in cash. Okay. That's yeah. what I was asking. Yeah, we're not, it's not, we're not, they didn't, they're not using retained earnings the way you would use on a balance sheet here. They're just using it to say reserve or money left over or whatever. That's so. what I, that's what I thought, okay. but I just want to ask. <laughs> okay, thanks. All right. Alan Jones, did I cut you off before you got finished asking questions? No. Okay. Charlie, I'm sorry, Chris. do you have questions? You're muted, Charlie. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, I, I, so Annie, I have several questions here. Okay. Um, so the the overall expense budget's growing by three hundred nineteen thousand. That's like almost mm -hmm. twenty percent, well, more than fifteen percent. Yep. And there's one hundred fifty thousand of the increased expenses in items fifty three ten ten through fifty three. One or ten forty, mm -hmm. and plus um, the reservoir supplies program. That's fifty k. Um, that's a that's a huge jump in expenses. Do, do you know why those uh, like what 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 is fall contra winter contra? So so what all those line items are is that is Joe trying to create essentially cost centers for his programming. So fall contra is fall contracted services, fall contracted programs. They've hired an outside organization to come in and do a program. Same thing for winter, spring, and summer. And then the fall in, winter in, spring in, and summer in is all in-house programming. So they are providing the programming either using their own staff or by hiring staff directly as opposed to contracting for a service. Okay, so so the, that there's 100 to 150,000 in these outside yes. contracted services. Now, mm -hmm. are they uh, completely variable? In other words, if the, if the revenues don't come in on the revenue side, do those expenses go away or is the town on the hook for that? So I don't believe the town would be on the hook for it. The, 
uh, the enterprise fund would be on the hook for it. Well, the, but, the, the town guarantees the enterprise fund. Can I, can I finish answering? Sure. So um, the the these are the costs of the programming, and then he similarly splits out the revenues. Okay, so he's predicting, um, and it's not going to be sort of one for one at this point, but he's predicting increases in revenue because he's increasing fees. And I believe he's assuming some increase in participation. So I believe that these increased costs are relative to increased participation, but um, I didn't ask him specifically line by line to explain that. So I could go back and ask him to explain all these differentials if we need to. Annie? Yep. Uh, can I just add a comment? Which is sure. on the winter on the contracts. I use the winter's example. Most of the programs with vendors are set up as cost sharing arrangements, and mm -hmm. so standard rec department contract would say we're gonna like let's take the uh, and there's one I know near again, right? Take the winter futsal, which is indoor soccer. Yep. He sets up an agreement with the vendor that says um, we're gonna share player registration revenue sixty five thirty five. Okay. Right, so if a player comes in, he pays two hundred dollars for the season. He or she pays two hundred dollars. We're gonna split that six five thirty. So to answer Charlie's question, um, if the program doesn't occur, then both the revenue and the expense go away because they're directly linked to one another. And um, and that's that's how a lot of these. The same thing with the summer contract. Right, a lot of those are the summer day, summer camps, like that. I know the soccer camp that's big mm -hmm. in there. It's the same arrangement. It's a cost sharing arrangement with the vendor. They don't get a fixed rate. Right. And, and you know, there, there's concomitant increases in a bunch of income here. And um, a bunch of this has to do with increasing fees as well, either fees or participation. So, you know, we're in balance. I was less concerned about asking about the individual variation of costs here as long as we're in balance. What we did ask him was, how good do you feel about these revenue estimates? And he was pretty confident about them and had a good detailed explanation for how he derived them. So, um, but I'm happy to go back and ask any questions the committee would like answers to before we vote the budget, if you prefer. Madam Chairman. Yes, John. Uh, can I have a follow up here? Mm -hmm. um, so, are you, Dean, are you saying that uh, these um, the 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 uh, winter contract, then the spring contract, etc., these are are variable costs? In other words, uh, if if the um, if the projected attendance doesn't show up, the costs go away. Is that yeah, so to put a very fine point on it, um, so I'm tre the treasurer of the Arlington Soccer Club. We run, we are the line item that says winter contract and expense. We're not all of it, but we're the we're like 80,000 of it. And so we have an agreement with, with, chip, with the rec department that says, we're gonna run the league and then based on enrollment, we're gonna split the cost. So when 350 kids show up to the futsal league, we take 350 kids, we take the rate, that, that's how many there are applying. 350 kids are playing futsal, we take um, the fee. We sit down together, actually, it's off season. We look by the participation by the fee, we get what the total gross is. Then we back out our cost share. We split what we're sharing. Uh, we, it's our staff, it's our people. We hire people, we get the uniform, we get the equipment, all that. Um, so when that league didn't play during COVID, we didn't have revenue. We'd have participation, and we as the soccer club didn't get any income, so the town didn't have any expenses. Thus, it's a completely variable program on those contract lines. Thank you. That was my question. Okay. Anything further, Charlie? No, that's all. Thank you very much, Madam Chairman. Jennifer? Uh, yeah, I just have um, a small question, but also a big picture, picture question, just because I'm new to this. So mm -hmm. on a previous budget, we voted for the taxation total. Um, mm -hmm. You know, that's that's not true here, right? What Are we voting on the budget? And do we care how much, given that it needs to be in balance? 
um, what the particulars are. I'm, I'm just, it's just a big picture newbie question. I'm just not sure. So, and, and what happens if there's a cost overrun? Do they tap into um, the reserved money in without our us needing to vote on something? So um, I can answer the first part of that question, which is that the reason that we care is that we want to be sure that the recreation director is properly managing the enterprise fund. We want to review his budget and we want to, you know, as I said, my biggest question for him was his revenue estimates, right? Mm -hmm. This isn't taxation dollars. I can't go, you know, look at what our property tax incre agreed upon increase is. I have to trust that when he says he's going to make $150,000 at the reservoir, which is higher than last year's budget and higher than 2022's income, that he has a reason to believe that he will make that money. Right. So right. that was the general discussion that we had with him. And then the other thing we always are concerned about is whether or not there's a transfer from the general fund. That's a direct obligation on, on our taxes, which we are trying to get the enterprise funds to not have. Now, Later, when we get to AYCC and Council on Aging Transportation, you will see that we do make general fund contributions. And in fact, we're making a general con con fund contribution to the rink, but that is a long agreed upon process that covers some debt the rink took on that the town agreed to pay for. So um, that's why I'm looking at this. The yeah. other reason to worry about the retained earnings is because if those retained earnings drop below a certain level, then there is no cushion for plugging a hole here without the town taking it out of the general fund, presumably as a reserve fund transfer, although Charlie or Al would know better than I whether or not that's what we would do. Yeah, so I'm assuming that transfer in 2021 was something that we did after the fact. I mean, that wasn't budgeted for, I assume. I assume that's- Yeah, I believe so. Or... And, and it's such a small amount, I don't even remember why we did it. Right, right. Managing this budget at the time, but that would have been, um, you know, either that or we budgeted a larger amount, but we ended up transferring less than. Right. And then, so then the question is, if for some reason costs were to go higher, do they have the ability without going to us to transfer additional amount from the retained earnings? Or is that part of the process that they... I don't remember whether or not we have to actually vote on a transfer from retained earnings but I don't believe so. It's not our reserve fund. Right, right, right. I um, think Al Tosti has the answer to my question. It, it sounded like no or somebody, yeah. Al, Charlie, do you have an answer to that question? Uh, it has to be appropriated through town meeting. It has a to be from, a tra from retained earnings? From retained earnings? No. Well, it, However, in other words, these th this line, this transfer from the general fund, has to be no, no, no. We're talking about the retained earnings. If they the general need, fund, I know we have to appropriate. So if they need more money from retained earnings, for example, there was some sort of cost. Their own retained earnings. That, that would have to be a transfer approved by the finance committee. It does. Yes. Okay, um, and then some specific questions. So it sounded like the. 200,000 transfer from retained earnings this year is, is mm -hmm. sort of a one-time thing and they'll go back to the, the historic average of 100, is that? Yeah, I'm not even sure 100 is the historic average. But I that's think that's, budgeted that's for. still giving himself a cushion that he may or may not use. Got it. But yes, yeah, so we'll drop back to the usual budget after the uh, the renovations to the apartment are done and the, the preschools moved. Got it. And then I just have another particular question. So uh, unlike many budgets, there's somebody who does payroll. Yes. Is it not possible for the, the rank to, or for, for, you know, the rep to use the <laughs> payroll department that's located in the schools that does payroll for everybody else? That would feel more efficient. Um, I don't think that the payroll clerk and the payables clerk here are not using the town systems. Okay. I think that they are having to submit the paperwork to those town systems. Am I correct, Dean? Do you know? Yeah. You so he needs staff to do that. It's it's essentially a couple of administrative folk on his on his staff. Okay. Thanks. You know, particularly his payables are going to be complex. There's a lot of people involved. 
And there's there's a lot of expenses involved, right? Those contracts are not payroll, they're payables to you know the folks who who um, are running those programs. Right. Okay. So uh Al Tosti. Yes, thank you. Um there's a drop in health insurance. I'm assuming that somebody dropped off the plan. Yeah, we asked that question and um, Joe believes they either dropped off a plan or that people chose cheaper plans. There was no magic bullet there okay. that caused his health insurance to go down okay. and wasn't something he like worked at. Um, so. Okay. Uh, then, uh, I mean, just to follow up on the prior mm -hmm. question, you know, they've got the authorization to spend these amounts of money where they would get in trouble is if the revenues did not come in mm -hmm. that expected, in which case they would have to try to control the expenditures to match it. Yep. If, at, if at the end of the year, they were not successful in totally uh, wiping out the deficit, it would hit their mm -hmm. fund accounts and eventually uh, you know, would, uh, would hit free cash. But that's my question, actually. You said retained earnings were a million one. That, that, yep. I'm assuming that's carry, that includes carryover from June revenues to pay the summer expenses. Yeah, I didn't ask him to distinguish. I just uh, asked what the current balance yeah, is. My question would be, what was the fund balance at the end of fiscal 22? I didn't ask that question. Um, I could double check with Joe whether he meant that that was the fund balance at the end. I mean, to me, a fund balance is always the end of the fiscal year, but I didn't specifically put it that way down. So I will yeah. ask. Yeah, it, it's uh, sometimes okay. it gets asked at town meeting. And if if the 1.1 1 .1 is really a fund balance, then that's like way too high. Uh, well, if you recall, Al, it was about $700,000 last year. And then here's your 2022 actuals. Yeah. So it wouldn't surprise me if it's 1.1. 1. 1. Um, you know, unfortunately, that's not true for the rink. So, yeah, my, my guess is the 1.1 the 1. 1 includes the carryover from June, but it would be good if you could ask about what the fund balance at the end of 22 is. I will do that. Um, I will get maybe, well, I think last year we got Sandy to do a walkthrough of it in a little spreadsheet, and I'll see if I can get that again. Thank you. You're welcome. Rebecca? Thanks. I was just going to um, add one thing to clarify on this use of retained earnings. Because um, as Annie mentioned, he's talking about doing some renovations uh, to the school building so that they can move the preschool over. So um, one of the things that Joe mentioned is not only then do they save the rent they're currently spending on this Mass Ave building, but that he sees this as a way to increase capacity because there really is a huge demand in town for preschool during the school day and after school for elementary age kids. And so when they move locations, they will have a lot more capacity. So of course, you know, their, their revenue, but then their expenses will go up, but they'll be able to serve a lot more kids. So, um, so it's almost kind of an investment in the sense that, you know, they can really provide a lot more with this renovation. Yeah, it's a, it's a, I would say it's a very smart move, so. Thank you. Yeah, Al Jones. Well, now they just brought that up. The, the, I'm looking for the reduction in rent. Um, you mentioned Rebecca, or, or would that happen next year? Maybe next year. That would happen later. Okay. Yeah. Because yeah. right now the the investment this year for savings next year. That's right. The school building is still being used by the public school preschool. Okay. Right. So the public school preschool moves to the high school. Then they do the renovations. Then they move over the rec department preschool. Okay, do you know where the, what line item that you said, uh, I think Annie said that they're renting a commercial space now? I believe that that would be in the expenses for the, it would be in this KC after line. Okay. So it's these two items, the preschool and the KC after school, that's that program. Right. So okay. the, the rent's not specifically like lined out, but mm -hmm. it's it's part of those expenses. Okay, thank you. K Casey, also you see it in some places listed as kids care. It's yeah. the same program. Topher? 
Yeah, thank you. Just a question come up. So we have a public school preschool and then we have the rec department preschool. How it seems like wouldn't we just have one? I mean, I understand there might be two facilities here, but how did this come about? So yeah. I I I believe that the public school preschool is also partly a um intervention program for kids with um known uh uh Learning issues. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's not entirely, but it's it's partly integrated so preschool. Yeah, beginning to get at it's it's a way of beginning that intervention early, okay. so that you have a better um, later school experience. Right, Jen knows yeah. we know this better. Yeah, than I mean, I it's 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 state mandated, and about half of the the kids um, are have special needs, and the other half don't. And yeah. the idea that that's best practices to sort of integrate students in that way. Okay, yeah. and then the rec department is just running a. It's rec a, department's just running a something like that would be available to general anybody. preschool, right? Yeah. Right, you might be interested in boys and girls club or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So thank you. Any other questions? I don't see any other questions. I know that Annie has a list of things that she has to uh, get answers for, but does anyone see any reason why we can't still vote this budget tonight? I move the budget be voted uh, as presented. Second. Any further discussion? All right, we'll take a Roll call vote on the rec budget. Uh, Shane. Yes. Jennifer. Yes. Sophie. Yes. Ryan. Yes. Rebecca. Yes. Josh. Yes. Grant. Yes. Charlie. Yes. John? Yes. Daryl? Yes. Annie? Yes. Al Jones? Yes. Topher? Yes. Peggy? Yes. Al Tosti? Yes. Dean Carmen? Yes. Dave McKenna? Yes. All right, another unanimous vote. All right. Good. That budget is done. Thank you, Annie. And what's up next? Um, the rink. Okay. Um, okay, I'm going to try to remember all the questions I got asked. Um, uh, I believe. The clothing allowance here is contractual. I got that right, Rebecca. That was one of those contracted items. Same thing for the stipends. Um, can, can I interrupt, Annie? He, yep. he actually mentioned that some of the clothing stuff is is actually, you know, sweatshirts that say yeah, that's Arlington the, Rec Department. That's, I think, this, the uniform oh. that is in gloves. Dar, you're right. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. This is actually like yeah, uniforms, yeah. uniforms with, you know, polo shirts, et cetera, that they buy for. Um, the DCR lease payment, we are budgeting for that DCR lease payment, but apparently we never pay it. And we don't pay it because we are entirely responsible for the building and we haven't seen DCR since we signed the 99 year lease and we don't send them the money and they don't try to arrest us. Um, Maybe I shouldn't have said that in public, but anyways, um, you can see that Joe is trying to plan for increases in the cost of utilities. This um, energy line is energy to run the entire rink, you know, the chiller, et cetera, et cetera. Um, gasoline is vehicle, natural gas is heating for the parts of the rink that need to be heated that are not where the ice is. Um, I think I've got that all right. Repairs and maintenance. 
Um, the concession stand, there's $12,000 worth of expenses here. Alan Jones asked a question about this earlier today, and the answer uh, is that on the revenue side, the number is wrong. So when we get to the revenue side, I'll correct that number. Um, obviously, they didn't get I, I pointed out it was losing money. Yeah, it was losing money. <laughs> Um, and then this is that debt service on past um, projects, um, which we get $50,000 transferred in from the general fund to cover a part of this. Uh, and then these are the revenue estimates. That's that $50,000. It says transfer from other funds, but in this case, it is coming from the general fund. Um, the concession stand number here should actually be the same as last year, $15,000. So um, when we vote this, we're going to have to, oh, shoot. I may have to get Joe to do some different math in order to be able to vote this because we'll be out of balance at that point. It would be okay to show a gain. I guess, but <clears throat> you don't think we should check that with Sandy before we do that? Um, there used to be gains in these things. It's not a crime. All right, fine. We'll add some money to the. We'll we'll do some math and we'll uh, vote the budget accordingly. Um, so they're covering point two of the uh, off hours supervisor, point two of the director of recreation, um, and then part of all of the. Um, facilities coordinator and administrators. So this is the thing about rec and rink. They're all in the same building. It's the same staff. They are uh, attempting to split the uh, expense of the personnel and some of the other expenses evenly. So um, that's why you see the same titles with the salary split. Okay. Um, I don't think there was anything else dramatic to say about this budget. Rebecca, do you remember if there was anything else dramatic to say about this budget? Um, not dramatic, but one sort of interesting thing was if you look at the energy costs, um, energy referring to electricity and then also natural gas. Um, natural gas, uh, he said, also runs the dehumidifier for the ice skating rink. And just one thing I was surprised by is he said that they can really notice the difference in weather. So if we have, when we're having warm winters, um, it really, it he really notices how much harder it is to keep the rink cold. So some of that budget increases energy actually costing more. And some of it is that he thinks he needs more energy just to keep the rink cold and yeah. dehumidified. Yeah. Questions? John. Yeah, just curious about the um, the debt service, $58,000, $56,000, just what that relates to. Yep. Um, I, I, I can't tell you specifically what projects, but I know there have been some past um, uh, capital maintenance projects at the building that were um, serviced out of the enterprise fund, but that the town has agreed to uh, reimburse part of that debt service. And that's what the transfer from the general fund is. I would have to have somebody with more history to know exactly what the details of that are. But so it's, so it's, it's related to debt held by the town, not debt held by the, the Ed Burns Arena. Well, it's, ah. yeah, sort of. Okay. Charlie can explain that. Madam Chairman. Okay, yeah. Charlie. Uh, yes, the, the uh, a number of years ago, the agreement was made, uh, an agreement was made between the Capital Planning Committee and the town and the uh, Enterprise Fund that the Capital Planning Committee would fund um, on certain projects, one of which were, I think was a, um, a, a, a renovation of the electrical system at the rink. Um, the, the, the Capital Planning Committee would fund uh, 50 percent and the balance was going to be coming out of the retained earnings or the the uh, surplus in the enterprise fund that's that's what that's all about that's the reason for, the way it says transfer from other funds it doesn't say transfer from general fund it's it's coming from the capital budget charlie got it can i just on that 
comment you just made, Stan, I just just to clarify, because we have a lot of new members, and you can stop when I'm wrong. It, if I if I recall where this all started was this goes way back. I think it's like during the Romney administration. Yeah. The rink was a DCR property. DCR gave it control of it to us under, like Andy said, a 99-year lease with a requirement to do certain maintenance on the building. So it's like, here, we're going to give this to you for like $10,000 a year. You've got to do all this maintenance. And the, and the enterprise fund at the time couldn't support the debt service. So it wasn't like we just, it's not a willy-nilly decision. It wasn't, uh, it was like dealing with the circumstances we had, which is how we got to that agreement. Is that a fair way to put it? No. Okay. How would you put it? I would put it that they were specific. Um, uh, there were specific capital requests made to the capital planning department. And since it was coming from an enterprise fund, uh, we wanted to see, I was chairman of the capital planning committee at the time, but we wanted to see the enterprise fund pay some of those um, debt service costs. Mm -hmm. So some of the costs come from the enterprise fund and some come out of the capital budget, which is essentially the general fund, but it's, a, a, you know, part, it's allocated as a capital budget. Right, but these, what I was pointing out, these were triggered off of the shift. This all started when the state gave us the building. When it was a DCR building, we weren't doing capital on it. Oh, okay. yeah. That's, that's what I was getting at. That may be, I can't, I don't know. When when did that shift take place? I don't recall. <laughs> like a long time. I, yeah. I, I think Romney was done. Yeah. I mean, I, I have the uh, contract someplace, but I don't remember when it was done. Jennifer. Oh, I was just wondering if there was a uh, reserve fund and how much around how much was in it. Yes, there is retained earnings here as well. And the last time the number Joe gave me on that. Oh, I'm losing track of where my documents are. Hang on one second. Annie, I have 105,000. Yes, that sounds right. $105,000. So considerably less. And uh, Joe's comment was that it's a little too close for comfort. So I don't know whether he's hoping that, um, you know, somewhere in here, he'll get more money into that by in, in achieving more revenue than he's predicting or what. But, um, you know, he's aware that he needs to get that up because that's his cover, as Charlie said, for uh, anything that's off in his budget. So, uh, thanks. Okay. Any other questions? Jennifer, you still have your hand up. Are you done? Sorry about that. So, Annie, what is your recommendation? Uh, well, my recommendation is that we vote this budget, but that we need to add 3,000. $893 to the revenue side. Um, and I can do that math if I can get to my um, calculator in just a sec. And I want to. Or plus three thousand eight hundred and ninety-three equals okay. So the budget as printed, except that the revenue adjustment will make this revenue number here six thousand six hundred and fifty-seven thousand three hundred and fourteen dollars. And I'm doing that based on turning this into $15,000. Dean, you want to check my math? I, I got the same numbers. Okay. Alan, check my math. Mm -hmm. Okay. So everybody it, needs to either note in your budget book or somewhere that we are voting uh, a revenue surplus of several thousand dollars here. 
And that, I think you have to add it on the, on the balance line above. That 3,890, right underneath revenues. Yeah, the balance instead yes. of zero. Okay, so instead of zero, that will be a positive. 3,893. 3,893. You are correct, Charlie. Does everyone understand what we're, we have done? Can you repeat that number, please? So the the new revenue number will be 657314, Tara, and the balance will then be 3893. And the positive, right? Positive. Thank you. Okay. Is there a second to that? Second. Any questions, discussion? Shirley. Um, Madam Chairman and, and Andy, I think the balance has to be has to be negative, right? Um, oh, because the revenues are negative. It's not yeah. negative, it's just a credit balance. It's credit balance has to be in parentheses. Yeah, that's just what I wanted to. Okay. Got it. Does that make sense, Tara? That we're representing re representing revenue as a positive, as a as a number in parentheses. Yes, I just don't know um, if I said the Ed Burns Arena Enterprise Fund budget totaling six hundred fifty three thousand four hundred twenty one dollars in expenses, offset by six hundred fifty seven thousand three hundred and fourteen in revenue, with a three thousand eight hundred ninety three dollar Resulting Profit. balance. Surplus. Profit. Surplus. Profit. Surplus. Resulting surplus. surplus. Okay. Yep. Grant? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, is there a reciprocal entry in the uh, next page to offset that as well? Yes. Yeah, so where it says concession stand, stand on the revenue budget yep. on 173 where it says 11,107 that should be 15,000 15k even okay thank you you're welcome L Jones and, and just a detail but we don't present this number corrected this all goes into the finance committee report and I don't represent positive revenues with parentheses on them yeah so it, it'll be clear right Cool. All right, we have a motion. It's been seconded. Unless there are any other questions or any discussion, we will take a vote. Does everyone understand what we're voting on? All right. Um, Shane. Yes. Jennifer. Yes. Sophie. Yes. Ryan. Yes. Rebecca. Yes. Josh? Yes. Grant? Yes. Charlie? Yes. John? Yes. Daryl? Yes. Annie? Yes. Al Jones? Yes. Topher? Yes. Peggy? Yes. Altosti? Yes. Dean Carmen? Yes. Dave McKenna? Yes. In a unanimous vote, that budget has been approved. What next? Annie, Rebecca? Um, we, Rebecca have, but we have 17 minutes. I'm ready and to start on libraries. Let's use it. I'm ready to start on libraries if that works. <laughs> Sounds good. All right. So let's see. I'm going to share this. All right, are you able to see this library budget? Um, so Annie and I had the opportunity to talk with uh, Anna Litton, who is the new director of libraries. Um, and she was super helpful and um, very responsive. So that was terrific. Um, uh, 
she walked us through a bunch of these items. So if we start with salaries, um, the library currently has 24 full-time and 14 part-time staff. The part-time staff are not fully benefited. Um, and they also have 16 pages who are not benefited. And then they do make some use of on-call libraries and library assistants. Um, if we look at the salary line item here, um, you can see that the, the percent increase is you know, quite modest. It's 1.27%. Uh, so there's a few explanations for why that's pretty reasonable. Um, one is that it is, it's the increase over last year where last year's budget is modified by the collective bargaining that was approved at the end of town meeting. Um, and if you refer to the budget explainer document that we got from Julie, she did note that due to a restructuring of their contract, staff in the library and union and who are grade one or two will stay at the same step in fiscal year 24 as they were in fiscal year 23. Um, we also see that with the hiring of the new library director, she's coming in at a lower salary than the previous library director. Um, and then also it's not reflected in this budget document, but um, Anna also did tell us that they have just last week filled this position of the assistant library director. Um, there's a branch librarian coming over. And although it, it doesn't show that in this document, the a new assistant librarian is also coming in at a, at a slightly lower salary than the previous person holding the position. Um, what else? One of the questions that we had uh, referred to this overtime amount you know, my, my question was just, does that suggest that you need to hire somebody to cover those hours? Um, and she said that that refers to uh, the, the Sunday use of the library. So the contract requires that they offer the Sunday hours as overtime to the staff. Um, differential, just for those of us who are new, just refers to the fact that they get a slightly higher rate for hours worked in the evenings. Um, and the clothing and the stipends are just contractual items. Uh, if you look down at all of our various expenses, you see that they're all just level funded with last year. Whoops, what am I doing here? Um, with the exception of this item towards the bottom, the licenses and annual fees of 22,000. And what that refers to is a software license of the MLN software. This is the software that actually runs the library system. So, so for example, the software that runs the RFID system that allows you to check out the books by just putting your books on the stack, on the desk. Um, they, the decision had been made to move this item from previously it was in the capital budget. Um, so it's not a new expense. It's just no longer in the capital budget. Um, and I, my understanding is that the decision there was because, you know, if you think of a capital expense as some software that you purchase and then you own the software, uh, this is a little bit different in the sense that we have to pay the licensing fee every single year in order to use the software. Um, but it's not, it's not something new that we're buying. It's just new onto the budget. Um, and then another thing, just to be clear about, is this other contracted services, which is the, you know, we're, we budgeted the same amount as last year. That refers primarily to uh, the, the contract with the Minuteman Library Network. So that refers to um, exchanging of materials with them, but also software or sorry, uh, electronic subscriptions and things that we get through the Minuteman Library Network. Um, what else? Oh yeah. So one, one thing that she emphasized when she talked with us was also you know, what we vote on in the budget is this, these other expenses for the library. So separate from payroll, if we're allocating something like half a million dollars, the, the library is actually spending about a million dollars on all of these um, expenses where they get the other half a million from some from state aid, uh, some from the Fox and Robin resale shop, some from the Friends of the Robins, which runs book sales, some from the Arlington Library Foundation and some from the trust funds. So when we look at our budget, you know, we're only spending, it appears from this budget, it looks like we're spending like 200,000 on books and materials, for example. Um, but in fact, a lot of the, you get essentially twice as much spending um, in this expense category 
because of the outside revenue sources. So we're getting extra books and materials, lots of different programs. Um, during the pandemic, they were able to provide a lot of technology services to the community. Um, they're not reflected in the budget here because they came through these outside sources. Uh, and then the last thing is this Fox offsets at the bottom refers to 25,000 that comes to help pay for Fox librarians um, from the little Fox shop. Um, uh, yeah, then the last, the only last thing I was going to mention was um, it's not, it's not important for today's discussion, but just to give people a heads up that when we're talking about capital budgets in the future, the library is really hoping to eventually rebuild the Fox library. They really see that that's a need. So there's going to be, um, the state is going to be opening up the grant process soon for, for them to apply for potentially, you know, help rebuilding the Fox library. So I suspect we'll hear more about that in the future when we talk about capital. Annie, is there anything you wanted to add about libraries? I just wanted to add, and I don't know if you have that um, slide quickly available, but it turns out that we are the fifth highest like library system in the state for circulating items. Um, and we're sort of behind like Brookline and Newton and Cambridge and Boston. Um, so we beat out Worcester. I don't know if that's right. interesting or not, but I thought that was kind of cool. Uh, so the library is highly in demand, and that demand has been going up for all kinds of materials. Um, and That's right. She also said that we're the highest user um, of every every system in the Minimum network. So we're really taking full advantage of our membership in that as well. Yeah. Um, so this is a highly in demand uh, service to the community. Um, one other thing to note, just because it's always um, a a thing that everybody on the finance committee should keep in mind that we have an obligation to spend a certain amount of money on our libraries in order to get our state aid and to continue to participate in the Minuteman um, network. If we fall below, I forget what the term is, Rebecca, but we must have put it in the notes somewhere, right? Somewhere. Um, but our, you know, minimum required allocation, I think it is. Um, if we fall below that minimum required allocation, we run the possibility of being decertified and no longer having access to the minimum network. Um, so uh, it's something to just always have in the back of your mind about our obligation to our library budget. Stepping off my soapbox. Um. <laughs> Thank you. All right, uh, questions, L. Jones. Uh and regarding that soapbox, do you know how close we are to that cliff? Any idea? I, I don't believe that it's an issue this year. One of the reasons it came up in discussion with Anna is because as we continue to try to move maintenance lines, like the maintenance line you're seeing here into the facilities budget, we've moved part of the library maintenance there. We then had to prove to the state that that was actually money spent on the library. So as much as it's more practical to have facilities have control of it, we need to be sure we can work out the accounting and the accountability to the state for that money being spent on the library um, before we can complete that process. Thank you. So, um, we have come close in the past. We have had times when we were uh, delaying an override because of the condition of the economy where we had to ask for waivers to that requirement and where we cut hours. It's, there's also an hours requirement. We have to be open a certain amount. Um, so it is um, something that in, in stressful times can be an issue and we just all have to keep in mind the consequences of too deep a cut. Sofer? Yeah, thank you. Um, sorry, I'm, the Fox offsets, could you, I'm quite, I, someone coughed or something. I kind of missed that. So oh, sure. So there's a resale shop called the Fox and Robin, and basically, um, they make about 50,000 a year and they put some of the money, some of the money goes towards, um, materials and programs for children. And, and it would appear, you know, it, it doesn't appear on our budget. They just oh, fund I, it directly. Yep. So here. Um, but but then they pay twenty five thousand, and it's sort of unofficially to help cover uh, children's librarian at the Fox. 
So this is money that they voluntarily give us from the resale shop. Okay, thank you. Charlie, I saw your hand go up, but then down, do you have a question? Uh, actually, thank you, Madam Chairman, but um, Alan and, and uh, Annie uh, had a long discussion on the question I was gonna ask. Thank you. Um, I have a question about the trust fund. Is it is it a one is it one fund or a series of funds? Do you know that? I do not know that. Um, I I actually do. It is a group of funds. It is various um, former citizens of the town that have um, uh, bequeathed to the town some money to be invested and to provide funding for the library. I don't know how many funds it is. Um, but that's why it's called the trust funds because it's more than one. Um, Do you have any idea of how much in total those funds contain? I don't, but I would suggest that if they are throwing off $300,000 a year, there's a lot. Yeah. So, um, but I can uh, follow up on that. Um, and numbers on it. Oh, Dean, Dean, do you have the answer to that? Yeah. So the trust funds. So Annie's right. So it's it's. I would, the, 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 what I would answer this, it's both one fund and multiple funds. And so, as Annie said, it's multiple funds, but it's managed in one by one investment advisor. Um, I don't know who the town goes with these days. Um, when I say the town, it's measured the, the treasurer as custodian of funds manages it in consultation with the library trustees. I think that's what the group is called. And so, you know, they have an allocation, the state has required allocation to things you can to invest in. Um, I, th I forget, it's a big number. It's, I would say it looks like four or five million dollars. It's like real money. And so they meet like once or twice, the treasurer meets once or twice a year with the trustees. They go over the investment strategy, they go over the distributions, how it's going to be run, things like that. So that's kind of how it works. And then the money gets shows up here. Thank you. Any other questions? Jennifer? Uh, yeah, just a little question. What are the library pages? Um, those are the sort of, you know, for lack of a better word, the, the least um, the least skilled employees of the library. So people who, um, you know, reshelf books and things like that. So it's an is it a new expense or was it in new expense? Or my I'm misunderstanding this. So it was in 23, and I guess it's oh, it budgeted. is in 23. And I guess it is being budgeted in 24. It's been there for a long time. It's been there for a while. Okay. Yeah, I, yeah I was just I was just misreading it. Okay. Great, thanks. It's it's quite a few people, and they're all just grouped together. Yeah. Madam Chair, I move uh, the budget is printed. Do I have a second? Second. Second. All right. Any further discussion? Questions? All right. All right. If you um, want to uh, approve the budget as printed, say yes. Shane. Yes. Jennifer. Yes. Sophie. Yes. Brian. Yes. Rebecca. Yes. Josh. Yes. Grant. Yes. Charlie. Yes. John. Yes. Daryl. Yes. Annie. Yes. Al Jones. Yes. Topher. Yes. Peggy. Yes. Altosti? Yes. Dean Carmen? Yes. Dave McKenna? Yes. It's unanimous. Uh, the and library I, and budget. I, did, and I think that was a great job on the library as well. What's that, Dean? I think the library presentation was great. That was another first. I agree. Right? Thank you. Absolutely. Great. It was awesome. Can, can I just say that that given that Rebecca is my budget buddy, that I think she was much more articulate and organized than I was. So I really appreciated the, the uh, comeback for our team. Um, uh, Charlie, have a question? 
Uh, <clears throat> I have uh, two, two comments. Uh, following up on what Dean just said, I think our, our new members uh, tonight and last week have given really uh, spectacular presentations. They've ra raised the level of the game, so I congratulate them. And, and secondly, um, just a, a, a word of caution. Um, the town apparently uh, deployed a new Barracuda um, network protector. I don't know what the exact the term is. It's, it's like a firewall, um, which sits outside the town system. And I found out that uh, I was getting, uh, well, my emails to town uh, staff members were getting caught in the Barracuda. And when I finally talked to the IT department today, they, I don't know what they did, but they, they helped out. And then I found out that from, uh, from Ida Cody that in, in one five minute period, she got 15 emails from me. So um, just be aware that if you don't get a response from somebody you sent an email to, it might be that you're trapped in their new system. Good to know. Thanks, Charlie. Yeah. Charlie, did you, get, did you get a bounce back? No. Oh, that's bad. It just got disappeared. <laughs> El Tosti. Madam Chair, I move we adjourn. Is there a second? Second. All right, all in favor say aye. Well, aye. Hold, hold, aye. hold on. Uh, Topher has a question. Topher. Yeah, thanks. I just wanted to say um, we're going to be meeting about uh, the IT budget next week. So if you have questions on the IT budget, and I suspect some members may, uh, please get them to me uh, this week. Thank you, Topher. Annie? Yeah, I just want to add, similarly, we will be presenting the Health and Human Services budget in AYCC on Wednesday night, and we did get some questions after our budget review, so if anybody's looked at that budget and has additional questions, please get them to us so we have time to ask Christine for answers, um, and also to judge whether or not we should let her know that we're reviewing her budget on Wednesday and she may want to show up, so. Thank you. All right, um, I, there's a motion to adjourn. Seconded, all in favor? Aye. Say aye. aye. Any aye. opposed? All right, we are adjourned. I will see you all Wednesday night. Thank you very much. Good night all. Thank Good night. you. Night.